So good morning and welcome to our joint Anderson Anderson Brown and Aberdeen Considine Property Landlords Conference this morning. And firstly, may I say thanks to all of you for joining us and that's wherever you are based. Um, this is actually our fourth joint landlords conference with Aberdeen Considine, having previously held conferences in 2017, 18 and 19 in both Aberdeen and Edinburgh. This is our first online conference, however, and um, with all our presenters in different locations this morning. So please bear with us if there are any slight technical issues, but I have been assured it's all gonna be absolutely seamless. So hopefully no issues. And um, you should be able to see all four of us on screen um, at the moment. So please let me introduce Adrian from Aberdeen Considine and Bill and Lynn from Anderson Anderson Brown who are our presenters today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stuart Petrie. I'm a tax director at Anderson Anderson Brown. And I lead our business advisory services team who support all types of trading and property businesses. For a change, I won't actually be presenting today, but I am delighted to introduce today's Landlords Conference, which we have entitled Planning Matters Post-Pandemic. Firstly, I think I should acknowledge we could easily be accused of jumping the gun slightly with our title, um, as I'm sure we'd all agree, we're not actually quite post-pandemic yet. Um, but with restrictions on travel easing, the opening up of various sectors, and the success of the vaccine programme, it feels like the UK is certainly making progress, albeit I do fully appreciate that, unfortunately, this, there is a very different picture in some other countries right now. So um, a quick introduction to the content for this morning's webinar and to those who will be presenting. Um, moving on, firstly, um, Adrian Sangster, who is a leasing director at Aberdeen Considine. He will be discussing the effect of the pandemic on the residential property market, both looking back at the impact of the last 12 months and giving us his thoughts on how the market will be placed moving forward out of the pandemic. Secondly, you will hear from my colleague, Lynn Gracie, who is a director at AAB. Lynn leads our international tax team and she will focus on UK property tax planning and compliance matters from a non-resident individual's perspective. Last but by no means least, um, you'll hear from another one of my colleagues, Jill Walker, also a director at AAB and leads our private client tax team. Jill will cover some of the key tax planning issues for those with residential property portfolios and will outline some of the main benefits of having the correct tax efficient structure in place for your property business. Now we have received some questions pre-event and we will actually be able to take some questions during uh, today's webinar. Please do therefore submit any burning questions you have using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And we'll do our best to cover off some of these at the end of the presentations, um, time permitting, as we are aiming to finish, we ensure no later than 10 a.m. this morning. All of our contact details will be shown throughout the presentations should you wish to contact Contact us directly to discuss anything at all that we mentioned today. So, um, without further ado, please welcome Adrian from Aberdeen Continent. Thank you, Stuart, and I reiterate Stuart's welcome to you all who have taken time out of your day to join us for this webinar, and I hope you will find it of benefit. I will be looking back at the past year and assessing the impact on the Scottish private rental sector. Then I will touch upon where we are now, and finally, to provide my own opinion on where I believe our industry is heading. Last year was the 30th anniversary of me working in the private rented sector, and as we enter the year, I naively thought I'd seen and done it all. How wrong was I? Like every person on this webinar, and like every other business, we at Aberdeen Constant had to completely change our working practices, rewrite all our procedures, and totally reorganize our teams, all whilst ensuring the safety and well-being of our valued employees. Many reverted to home working and we entered a world where Zoom and Teams became the most commonly used words. What really encouraged me, however, was how quickly we adapted to the new world. And I can honestly say that after the first week, we felt as though we were under control again, which is just as well, because as we all know, in the wonderful world of renting, things still break down, leaks occur, tenants leave, or sometimes don't as the case may be, and rents still need to be collected and paid. 
there were plenty of other challenges, including contractors shutting down during lockdown, meaning others had to be sourced. Tenants also understandably had reservations about contractors attending their home to complete repairs. So jobs took longer to confirm as we had to complete a COVID checklist with all occupiers to ensure it was safe for contractors to attend, who in turn had to complete their own checks to ensure they were COVID free to enter properties. Tenants sadly also found themselves out of work. And while some wanted to give up their tenancies, Many had nowhere to go as travel was obviously restricted, so had to stay. We found ourselves involved in many negotiations with landlords and tenants regarding reduced rent periods, as many were also placed on furlough at 80% salaries and could no longer afford full rental. This is where I must pay tribute to many of our landlords who understood the situation and quickly agreed temporary reductions. Of course, consideration also had to be given to the fact that if the tenant left the property, it could sit empty for an unknown period of time whilst movement restrictions were at their toughest. During this time, however, arrears from those properties under our management didn't turn out as bad as I feared, with those late by 14 days or more remaining below 1% of our managed portfolio during this time. Obviously, as time moves on, and the furlough scheme comes to an end, we will be monitoring this very closely. We need to remember that the majority of landlords are not large wealthy organisations, but in many cases, individuals who may just have one property to let, possibly inherited, which they rely on for income. There is no doubt there have been some difficult aspects to deal with for all parties, and from a landlord perspective, there have been some specific challenges, including not getting access to properties in the majority of cases until tenants leave, and the knock-on effect that can have to getting properties ready for the market. Adhering to the existing rules and regulations of renting property was already a complex area to navigate, but there was also the additional matter of tenants going through difficulties as I've touched upon and managing a range of government policies that were put in place to mitigate the impact of COVID, including notice periods to terminate tenancies being increased for landlords by up to six months. Although unfairly, in my opinion, they remained the same for tenants at 28 days for private residential tenancies. At this point, I should mention the First Year Tribunal, who, as most of you know, was formed to deal with determinations of rent, repair, rights of entry, eviction issues, etc., um, to remove these types of cases from the jurisdiction of the Sheriff Courts. Our dispute resolution lawyers have acted on behalf of many landlords during this time in contentious cases where they have required First Year Tribunal involvement. This included tenants not vacating properties and rental arrears recovery. Prior to this webinar, I spoke to one of our most experienced lawyers in this case, th these cases, Carly Stewart, to ascertain how the tribunal have performed during the past year. And she advised that overall, it has been a positive experience. Carly advised that whilst the tribunal had to shut down for a number of months, they reopened in mid 2020. For hearings, you are now given a fixed telephone appointment with a telephone number and passcode provided. Compared to pre-COVID, timescales for hearings have actually improved, possibly a little too quick in some cases with respondents' written representations being provided and very little time given to review and respond before the hearing takes place. Also in the past, because the first year did not have a permanent building or staff in each location, they would have to wait until they had a list of cases to fill their day, then hire a venue and then arrange for everyone to attend, where they would cover four to six hearings a day. This sometimes meant a bit of a delay because you had to wait until they booked a full day, which was perhaps only once or twice a month. By conducting these hearings by telephone now, the tribunal members can be anywhere. So it appears they are getting through them much more quickly, which means cases can be resolved much more quickly for landlords and tenants.
Our lawyers are also finding that the tribunal members are always well prepared, having read the papers thoroughly. Again, this was probably only the case in eight times out of 10 pre-COVID, but for the telephone hearings, they have to read everything in advance because they're not sitting in a room with you with a folder of papers. Another point to note is that pre-COVID, if your notice to leave was incorrect, even just one day out, it was ruled as being completely invalid and you had to start again. Under the COVID rules, if your notice date is wrong, it is now just treated as though it has the correct date. This is so as not to catch people out. For example, if they gave two months notice, but because of the COVID rules, it should have been six months, the landlord is not penalised for that mistake. The notice is just treated as though it bears the correct date. A word of warning, however, this lenient approach will be removed when the COVID rules cease effect. So you need to make sure that your notices are prepared correctly or they will be declined and you'll have to start all over again. So the first year tribunal during COVID um, received pass marks of 10 out of 10 for their work during the pandemic for being well organised, hearings well controlled and excellent communication. Bringing things up to date, through April we began to witness the vaccination programme growing successfully and the number of COVID cases reducing significantly. Signs at last, hopefully, we were beginning to gain a degree of control in this unprecedented health crisis. We also began to see the UK economy reopening and at times it felt like the whole country was breathing a collective sigh of relief. As Britain appears to be taking the first steps to returning to some form of normality, with more than 60% of the population receiving at least one vaccination, we reflect on the challenges we have faced, but also start preparing for the way ahead. There is no doubt that the property market has ex experienced a tumultuous period during the pandemic, but we've come through it. On a positive note, it is clear that the rental sector has proved again to be extremely resilient during the pandemic, meeting the challenges head on and providing a vital service in this time of crisis and uncertainty. This was also true of the sector following the 2008 financial crash, where the flexibility of renting became very appealing to those people who were uncertain of the security of their long-term employment or had only been able to secure a short-term contract. This is very much the case now. Data provided by property portal CityLets showed that during the first three quarters of the pandemic that the average rent across Scotland actually increased year on year by 3.6% to £826 per month. Glasgow and Dundee witnessed the biggest increases at 5.7% and 4.2% respectively. Aberdeen also witnessed a very slight increase of 0.1% during this time. Edinburgh, however, did experience a fall of 4.1%, albeit it remains the highest rental area in Scotland, with an average of £1,085 per month. Looking at times to let again, it is a mixed picture throughout Scotland, where the average is now 28 days to let a property, which is down 3.4% year on year. There is no change in Glasgow where it remains at 20 days, but there's a big improvement where Dundee in Dundee where it's reduced by 22.2% year on year to 21 days. Aberdeen also experienced a slight fall of 5.9% to 48 days, which is still the highest in Scotland, although Edinburgh is closing the gap with a 50% year-on-year increase to 33 days. There has undoubtedly been a significant increase in demand from those looking for larger 
family sized rental homes and properties in rural areas. Smaller properties in these areas have also seen an increase in demand. Certainly the rise of home working and the reduction in the need to commute has been a key contributor here. Lockdown also appears to have made people more appreciative of space and having room to roam. I recently attended a webinar hosted by property portal Zoopla, who described the current lettings market as a door ring market, which I thought was quite apt. The centre of the door ring representing the city centre, where stock levels are currently higher, with many smaller flats currently available, but demand is currently lower. One bed flats in particular are taking longer to let unless it's in really good condition and has got some extras such as a maybe a dining kitchen rather than a galley or a dedicated you know, parking etc. Something that makes it stand out from the rest. The actual dooring itself uh, represents the suburbs and more rural areas where as a result of growing demand landlords are experiencing very quick and short void periods, with the consequence being that there is now a serious shortage of stock in and around these areas. One recent example is a four or five bed property in a rural location just outside Aberdeen, which we placed on the market at a rental over £1,500, and we received almost 20 requests to view within 24 hours. This level of interest in these larger properties I have not seen since the height of the oil boom. A big question is always, who are the people letting these properties? And there's definitely a mixture. Some of them have recently sold properties and are looking for temporary accommodation whilst they decide on their next permanent move. There are also others who are not confident on their longer term job security and attracted by the flexibility that renting, off, renting offers, as I've mentioned earlier. Furthermore, there are those that have lived in the city all their lives and would just like a change of scenery or find out what it might be like in a rural area before committing to moving permanently. I'll also look at the kind of the HMO market in, in Aberdeen um, in well, most cities. This is proving challenging. Last year, where we witnessed many students leave to return home. Also, of those who remained, we noted a larger proportion of them seemed to prefer living by themselves in one bed properties or sharing with maybe just one other in a two bed. It's difficult to gauge at this time how this market will perform this year, but I do expect to see increased demand, albeit perhaps not at the levels we've seen in 2018 or 19, for example. Becoming a landlord can be a daunting prospect, especially with the various regulations in place. There are bound to be a multitude of questions and concerns. But the important thing to realise is that there is plenty of professional help available to ensure that the process is as smooth as possible. And whilst there are undoubtedly challenges in the market just now, it may not be a bad time to consider adding properties to your portfolio. For example, in Aberdeen, the sales market is somewhat mirroring the lettings market at the moment with a huge amount of flats available. Um, and demand highest for the larger three, four bed properties. Therefore, if you are in lettings for the long term, there may be some good purchase deals to be done for flats. Although I would refer to my earlier comment where those flats that give that little bit extra will have a better chance of letting in the short term. Whilst the city centre lettings market is definitely more challenging at the moment, I am confident that it will return as students return to city centres, businesses reopen and life a bit closer to normality returns. Our lawyers and mortgage advisors are available throughout the country to provide further advice if you're interested. There are also further incentives such as our rent guarantee and legal expenses scheme.
With an economic recovery hopefully now on the way, it remains my belief that demand for properties will increase and continue to grow. One caveat to this, however, is that it remains my strong opinion that key to this recovery will be a period of stability in the country as we focus on steadying the ship. If we do that, then I firmly believe it gives us the best chance of getting us on the right road to recovery. Thank you for your time today. I hope you found this to be useful. My details are on the screen and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have later. I'll now pass you to Lynn Gracie from um, A to B, who will discuss non-UK resident landlords. Thank you for your time. Hey, good morning, everybody. Very much welcome the opportunity to speak to you today. I lead the private client international tax team at Anderson, Anderson & Brown. My team's role is to look after the UK tax affairs of globally mobile individuals. And because they are living somewhere else, then it follows it's not just UK tax advice we take care of, but with help from global associates, we deliver a joined up, very much global tax approach to clients' income and assets. And yes, I suppose we've been fortunate, we've been incredibly busy over the last 12 months for a variety of reasons. But in many cases, this has been due to clients affected by COVID travel restrictions, requests for tax help where some have found themselves stuck in the UK when they would usually be based overseas. Many contacting us for tax advice after realizing they can now work remotely just about anywhere. So are actively choosing to relocate to overseas. Certainly interesting times. But despite dealing with a wide cross section of individuals, there is a common investment philosophy and that is property investment. The UK property market is still seen as an attractive investment perhaps even more, more so by overseas investors who tend to feel this is still a relatively safe investment for their spare cash, especially compared perhaps to overseas investment structures. So today I'm gonna to run through the tax, um, UK tax aspects that need to be considered for these overseas uh, investors. Firstly, I will outline just why it is so important to ensure that they report everything correctly to HMRC. In this case, Big Brother is definitely watching. I'm going to confirm what non-resident landlords actually need to do to ensure that they are reporting everything correctly. That's both from a rental and a disposal perspective. So I'm going to look at income tax and capital gains tax aspects. Inheritance tax, well, it's probably something many don't consider. So I will confirm at a very high level how this might affect non-residents. I'll then outline some simple tax planning points that could reduce UK tax liabilities. And finally, I'll briefly mention recent changes to SDLT rates affecting overseas property investors. So in terms of HMRC's approach to non-resident landlords, well, what are they actually up to nowadays? It's definitely the case. The revenue has stepped up their activity in recent years to target non-resident landlords using their incredibly powerful connect data matching and risking tool. It can cross match something like 1 billion data items, not just tax returns. This includes data such as bank, insurance, council tax records. It looks at property websites such as Zoopla, Rightmove, even social media platforms. So if you're a non-resident landlord who isn't reporting rental income, the chances are the revenue will catch up with you. And that's when penalties for non-reporting would be significant. The revenue would take a dim, in, in fact, a very higher penalty view, if they are sending a letter asking a landlord to report. So it definitely pays the volunteer to disclose first the revenue. And that's something we can certainly help with if needed. There is another factor for many non-resident landlords to consider, and that is the global exchange of information agreements, such as the common reporting standards. This has resulted in an enormous amount of offshore details relating to individuals being sent straight to the revenue. This includes summaries of UK assets that have been declared to overseas tax authorities, perhaps not to the revenue, perhaps because a non-resident doesn't feel they need to report in the UK because they're resident overseas. And this report includes UK property. Thousands of letters have been issued to the revenue in the last 12 months as a direct result of foreign countries supplying the revenue with this type of information. Indeed, the revenue have made it very clear they are now recruiting specifically to help tackle this type of tax evasion, amongst others. So it's even more important to volunteer to report any undeclared rents before the revenue get in touch with you. 
voluntary disclosure of rental income can be made via the Revenues Online Let Property Campaign Facility. And this allows for much reduced penalties, like an amnesty, should definitely be considered. And then finally, in terms of revenue activity, well, 2020 brought significant changes to the reporting of rental income for non-resident corporate landlords. They must now pay corporation tax on rental profits. They must register for corporation tax and file tax returns to that effect. I think it's some things perhaps not yet fully appreciated by many overseas companies. So moving on in, uh, in terms of keeping, um, I've mentioned non-resident landlords many times here, but in terms of property ownership, we all know that property is held in a number of different ways by landlords. So what is the definition of a non-resident landlord? Well, strictly speaking for UK tax reporting purposes and at a very high level, for an individual landlord, this is someone who meets the criteria to qualify as a non-UK resident via HMRC statutory residence test. A non-resident company is one which has no place of business in the UK, which is registered overseas and owned and controlled overseas. And a non-resident resident trust is broadly one where none of the trustees are resident in the UK. So if you are indeed a non-resident landlord, then you must register as one under HMRC's non-resident landlord scheme. Whilst I've outlined exactly what a non-resident landlord is for UK tax purposes, specifically according to legislation, the revenue have deliberately left this scheme definition much broader. Presumably this is an attempt to capture tax due on any landlord who could potentially be non-resident, even if they are not in fact strictly non-resident. They just have to be outside the UK for more than six months a year. And the scheme requires tenants or agents to tell the revenue, revenue that they have a non-resident landlord, deducting basic rate tax from rents, issuing a summary tax certificate at the end of the year. And to avoid all of this hassle, if you like, the landlord can apply to revenue to receive rents without deduction of tax. But thereafter, the revenue will definitely expect rental income to be reported via tax returns, at least in the short term. So individuals and trusts must report the rental income and indeed any other UK sourced income on their UK tax returns each year. The usual progressive UK tax rates will apply. It's worth noting as a non-UK resident, only UK rates of tax apply, not Scottish rates. It is important to add that a claim for non-UK residents should be made on those tax returns. And as for companies, well, there is no requirement, as I've mentioned, to file corporation tax return and pay a corporation tax, which you can see is considerably less um, in terms of tax rates than owning the property as an individual. 2015 saw the introduction of capital gains tax charges for non-residents selling property here, residential property that is. From 2019, this was extended to include all land and property sales, not just residential. It effectively now includes sales of shares held in companies which are non-trading and considered to be property rich. And that is broadly where say 75% of the value of the company is made up of UK land and property. Plus it's got, got to be a substantial shareholding, which is more than say 25% ownership of the shares. For individuals and trusts, then any sale of directly held land or property or shares in a property rich company must be reported to the revenue within 30 days of completion. Now this applies even if there is no gain to report or even where there is a loss and differs to UK residents selling the same assets, who only need to report within 30 days where there is a gain actually subject to tax. Significant penalties will be charged if sales are not reported by non-residents, even if there is no tax to pay. Companies will they sit, as I've mentioned, within the corporation tax regime, and they would report sales as part of the corporate tax return. So sales of residential property, continue to be treated differently when it comes to the application of capital gains tax rates. Higher rates apply to individuals and trusts, up to 28%. Overseas company would pay UK corporation tax rates, 19%. Where the property was held at April 2015, the default position is to use the April 15 value as, to the, as the cost is set against proceeds to calculate the gain. But you can choose to use the original cost and either apportion the resultant gain relative to the period after April 2015, or just use a straight line calculation using the cost without any apportionment, just effectively whichever gives the best tax result 
As mentioned, non-residents selling non-residential land and property or shares in property-rich companies became subject to UK capital gains tax from April 19. If the property was held before then, then similar to the April 15 approach, you can instead substitute the April 19 market value instead of original cost. This again is a default position and you would need to formally elect if you want to instead use the original cost. Rates, tax rates are a bit less than those applied to residential sales, so 10 or 20% instead of 18 or 28% for individuals, and 20% instead of 28% for trusts. When it comes to the actual capital gains tax calculation, it can sometimes be assumed that using the April 15 or 19 valuations will always provide the best tax result, particularly when the property has been held for many years before these dates. But we would always recommend that a bit of number crunching is done, especially when it comes to the sale of residential property that was historically the seller's main home. So this is a perfect example of a situation when using the April 15 value doesn't necessarily give you the least amount of chargeable gain. So here we have a property that was acquired in 2006 for 450,000, sold in 2021 for 790,000. So owned for 15 years with a profit on sale of 340. You can see that the April 15 value is much higher than the original cost at 625,000. And at first glance, well, you would think this would give you the least amount of chargeable gain. Because this was previously the main home from 20, 2006, sorry, to 2015, that proportion of gain can actually be stripped out of the tax charge if the gain is calculated using the original cost instead of the April 15 value. Plus we can include the last nine months of ownership as being exempt. Even, even if it isn't your, currently your main home during that time. So despite the difference in sale profit using cost instead of the 2015 value, the available exemptions mean an extra, say 38,000 can be taken out of the tax charge. Even using the apportionment calculation gives a better tax result, but the straight gain calculation here definitely gives the best tax result. So inheritance tax, now it's probably worth mentioning that if you were non-UK resident, but you are still UK domiciled, which is a very different aspect than residence, something which is broadly acquired at birth and follows your father's domicile, then your worldwide assets would fall still within the UK inheritance tax charge on death, no matter where those assets are based and despite being non-UK resident. However, non-UK domiciles can exclude overseas assets but any UK based assets, including property, will still fall into the UK inheritance tax net. Now, before 2017, non residents could hold residential property in overseas trusts or companies, and this would shelter the value of the property from UK IHT. But successive governments have tried to ensure that non resident property investors, investors are not tax advantaged compared to their UK resident counterparts. And so from 2017, this exemption no longer applies to residential property. Overseas investors do still want to buy property here, that is a fact, but it's perhaps not quite as attractive as it used to be in that respect. So what can non-residents do to reduce their UK tax liability? Simple things really. Most can claim still, despite being non-resident, the UK personal tax allowance to set against rental property before tax is applied. It just therefore makes sense to place property into joint names with partners or spouses to use both allowances. We have many clients that relocate all over the world and we always recommend that relocating clients review their worldwide assets ahead of any move to another jurisdiction. And absolutely, particularly if they're moving to the UK, property ownership is always included in this review. And as mentioned, a non-UK resident has the chance to substitute April 15 or 19 values instead of the original cost on a sale. This could allow them to sell or gift to family members, for example, property free of tax when non-UK resident, which they would not be able to do once they get back to the UK. They could, for example, consider moving property into a limited company before they come back with no capital gains tax liability, which would suit the much reduced tax rates for the rental income stream going forward. The UK, um, it still retains generous um, capital gains tax exemptions for property that used to be the main home. And the main residence exemption can be retained if 90 nights per tax share are spent in the property. 
This can be tricky if that number of days here would result in them becoming UK tax resident. So it does need very careful management. If they lived in the property before, then work overseas, move back into that same property when they come back to the UK. Then provided they haven't acquired another home elsewhere, they could extend the exemption to cover the entire period of absence. But finally, I'm afraid non-residents simply can't escape the potential inheritance tax charge on residential property. Lastly, another tax that is very relevant um, when acquiring property is, of course, SDLT and LBTT. And there is a new SDLT rate for non-residents acquiring property in England and Northern Ireland, which is an extra 2% on top of the existing SDLT rates. But there is a very different definition of what a non-resident is for SDLT purposes. This bears no resemblance to the income tax definition. And I would recommend that advice is definitely taken to get that, that right. There is now, therefore, a very clear difference in rates applying to non-resident property investors between England and Scotland. As you can see, for someone looking to, <coughs> excuse me, to acquire an investment property and assuming they already own another property, they would pay an additional 5% charge in England, but 4% in Scotland. Whilst this seems better for Scotland, it has to be said the thresholds and the LBTT bans still usually results in Scottish property investors paying much more, particularly on higher value properties. It perhaps just doesn't seem to be widely appreciate, appreciated that this is the case. So um, this has been a very high level summary of some of the tax aspects for non-resident investors that they have to navigate around and plan for. Um, the last few years, as Adrian has mentioned, has brought significant changes, and this applies also to overseas landlords, and it's definitely created a great deal of complexity. We would always say professional legal and tax, avoid, tax advice, in our view, is an absolute must, just to ensure that landlords firstly are aware, secondly are correctly reporting their position to HMRC, and lastly, are able to efficiently plan for all tax eventualities, just so there's no nasty tax surprises. Um, Many thanks for listening. I'll hand over to my colleague, Jill Walker, who is now going to focus on the changing landscape for UK-based property investors rather than non-resident non investors. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn, um, for that update. It was really interesting. Um, and that kind of leads me neatly on to tax planning for UK resident landlords. So um, in terms of me personally, I have a particular interest in property letting businesses and I've seen a real surge in tax planning around property portfolios over the past few years, partly on the back of all the tax changes that have been introduced and also because of the differential between um, personal income tax rates and corporation tax rates. Um, now is a really good time to review the impact of these rules on your property businesses, especially in advance of the autumn budget, whilst we've got certainty on rates and allowances. In particular, I suppose that the budget just passed, we had expected quite a high increase in capital gains tax rates which didn't materialise but we still have an autumn budget to come and this could be introduced at a later rate a later date um, and I suppose the kind of feeling is that there's been a lot of support from the government on Covid and that will need to be paid for somewhere although the Conservative government have confirmed that they won't increase income tax rates but there is a scope obviously to increase capital gains tax rates so while the rates are low now is a good time to kind of look at your position. So in terms of what I'm going to cover today um, Unfortunately, most of the changes that we've had increased taxes payable on rental income. And I suppose landlords to a greater extent feel like they've been victimised because there's been a lot of tax changes. But I'm also going to cover some of the tax reliefs that are still available to mitigate some of these tax increases and um, to reduce your overall tax exposure. Um, there are a lot of moving parts, so not to bore you with uh, tax rules and legislation, I'm going to run through some case studies that we've done um, here in the office just to kind of show you how, how you can reduce your tax exposure and what the possibilities are and what the tax charges are and what that involves. So in terms of the next slide, I suppose just a sort of summary as to where we are now. Um, for those who have debt um, to fund their property acquisitions, you'll be aware that finance costs and your sort of mortgage interest is now fully restricted to a basic rate tax reducer, so you no longer get higher rate tax relief on your mortgage interests. Um, and we'll see the increase in tax liabilities when we start to move through the kind of 2021 tax return season, which we're just doing now. Um, main residence relief has been restricted further 
So, for instance, the lettings relief that you used to get when you let a main home um, has now gone unless effectively you live in that property with the lodger. Um, and the exemption for the final period of ownership has also been reduced to nine months. So, and that's been gradually reduced over a number of years. It used to be three years, but it's now down to nine months. So that relief has been reduced a lot. Um, capital gains tax on residential property. So Lynn covered that um, for non-residents and she mentioned the kind of UK resident position. Uh, the tax is now no longer due by 31 January following the end of the tax year. Um, it's now due within 30 days. So I'll cover more of this um, in a further slide. LBTT, <clears throat> when COVID sort of hit, each of the devolved nations introduced a, a holiday on their sort of stamp taxes, which effectively meant that they extended the band on which you paid 0% stamp taxes on a property purchase. Um, of course, the rules are different in each nation, just to make it a little bit more complicated. But in summary, Scotland has a land and buildings transaction tax, LBTT. It's holiday ended on 31st of March. It's the only one of the devolved nations that didn't extend it. Um, and it didn't apply to second home purchases in any case. So uh, that's sort of been and gone. In England, they've got stamp duty land tax, also in Northern Ireland, which is SDLT. Um, and they increased their 0% band up to 500,000. And it did apply to second home purchases. Um, that has been extended to a certain degree, so it will be reduced to 250,000 from the 1st of July to the end of September, when it will return to the usual £125,000 zero percent band. Um, and Wales have got a separate tax again, so they've got land transaction tax, but like Scotland, it didn't apply to the purchase of second homes, and they have also extended their zero percent band until the 30th of June, where it will be 250000 and then reverts to 180000 thereafter. Um, Lynn did also mention the second property stamp taxes. So this is the one that um, always makes clients fall off their seat when they realise how much it is. In Scotland, it's a 4% charge on a purchase of a second home um, with a purchase price in excess of 40,000. And it's not just the excess of 40,000. So once the purchase price is in excess of 40,000, the whole lot is subject to tax at 4%. Um, in England and Northern Ireland, effectively add 3% on to your standard Bandons, so you just pay an extra three percent at each at each level, and in Wales they add four percent onto their bands. Um, so it's slightly different in each of the nations. In terms of reporting capital gains tax in thirty days, um, the revenue confirmed this week that they have issued something like one point three million pounds of late filing penalties to over thirteen thousand taxpayers, and I suspect that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. Um, because that'll just be the ones that they know about and not the clients who haven't, uh, individuals who haven't actually reported. But it was introduced from 6th of April 2020 and quite clearly based on those penalties, isn't widely, isn't a wide awareness of it at all. Um, and we still find it catches even our own clients out because they contact us to ask about what their capital gains tax liability will be on the sale of a second property. Um, and are usually surprised to know that they've got to pay the tax within 30 days. But Effectively, if you've got a capital gain on the sale of a property, it needs to be reported and the tax paid within 30 days. And you can no longer uh, pay it 31 January following the end of the tax year after the disposal. Um, you only need to report if you've got a chargeable gain, which is different from the rules that Lynn ran through for non-residents. So if the gain's covered by losses or annual exemptions, or for instance, your main residence relief, then you're not caught by these new rules and there's no reporting requirement. The penalties are in line with self-assessment penalties, and these can mount up when you hit daily penalties and tax gear penalties, um, which come in a few months after the deadline. So it is important that um, you file these returns on time. Um, and what makes it sort of difficult is that often the computation needs a best estimate. So like Lynn mentioned earlier, on residential property, the tax rate is 18 or 28%, depending on if you're a basic or higher rate taxpayer. But in a tax year, you might not know if you're how much basic rate band you're going to have left, if any. So you have to put in an estimate based on the capital gains, based on what you think is the likely position. But there is the option to go back and amend the calculation at a later date once you have better information. Um, but it's just really important to be aware of this change. Uh, the revenue seem to be quite keen to issue penalties on this um, and I don't think they'll accept just not knowing about it um, as a reason for, for withdrawing the penalties. <clears throat>
So one of the most common questions I would say that we get in terms of people with property portfolios is whether or not they should hold those properties personally or whether they should incorporate a company. Um, what I would say is that company incorporation is not the answer in every case, and it definitely depends on the numbers um, and a whole other variety of factors. Um, and sometimes you get clients with very similar portfolios, but actually the answer is very different for each. And I thought this was probably easily demonstrated by a case study, which is based on a client scenario that we've dealt with previously. So in this scenario, we have got Mr. and Mrs. Smith, they're very original, who um, have a portfolio of properties. They've got six properties. Um, they're already both higher rate taxpayers. So if they're Scottish, that means they're paying income tax at least at 41% on their profits. And for any mortgage interest, they'll only be getting basic rate tax relief for that. Um, both of them had significant assets and income elsewhere. So they didn't need the rental profits to spend. They didn't need it to maintain their lifestyle. They had two young children, neither of whom worked or had any assets or income in their own names. Um, so with regard to so this is the kind of property portfolio that they had um, and they were purchased over many years um, with original cost and market values very different depending on the property itself. The property with the largest gain you can see was the one that this used to be the Smith's own home. Um, for simplicity here, I've assumed that it is covered by main residence relief, i.e. they've moved out less than nine months ago, and so um, they get full main residence relief on that property. Um, but initially, the case study kind of arose because a client approached us um, and asked about setting up a property company because they'd heard that this was a great idea to save tax. They were also obviously concerned about their annual tax bill on the property profits that they were paying. Um, they had the impact of the reduction to tax relief on their mortgage interest because they had some debt funding. And they also had um, some concerns around the IHT exposure because they had actually no idea what that was or if they could mitigate that in any way. So, so I suppose first step first is how did we deal with this? So we looked at the pros and cons of incorporating that property company. Um, and some of the main things that sometimes clients don't realise that there tends to be tax transaction costs of getting the properties into a company where you've got an existing portfolio in your own name. And what you need to weigh up is how much those costs are and how much you'll save in the long term in terms of the corporation tax rate, which is much lower than the personal income tax rate. Um, and you also sort of need to weigh up what your intention is with that property portfolio in the future. You know, do you intend to sell it um, in a few years' time? Because then you have corporation tax on the sale of the properties, and then you've got personal taxes to try and get the money out of that company. So it's a bit of a juggling act trying to understand not only what, what the position is now, but what the client wants to do with that property portfolio in the future. So <clears throat> initially the company option sounds great. You've got corporate tax on rental profits at currently 19% against a personal tax charge of 41% or even 46 if they're an additional rate payer. We just need to watch because obviously at the budget we had um, the proposed increase to corporation tax, which will come in from April 2023, um, where profits will be taxed at 19%, whether 50,000 or lower, up to 25% on profits over 250,000. So you might find a larger property portfolio, you could potentially be in a graduated rate over and above the 19%. Um, and the sort of other advantage to that is that the low corporation tax rate leaves much higher net post-tax amounts in the company, either to make further property investments or to repay the debt. I suppose we need to understand first what the tax costs are of getting this property portfolio into a company. And those main costs will be capital gains tax and land and buildings transaction tax. So the main principle is that when you transfer a property portfolio into a limited company, you're treated for tax purposes if you've sold them at market value. Um, because the company is a separate legal entity. So in this example, the total value of the property disposals would have been 1.7 million for tax purposes, even though effectively there's no consideration paid, the company will be due you that 1.7 million pounds, which you can then draw down tax free. But there's no cash in the company to immediately pay you that money 
up front. So um, in terms of calculating the capital gains tax liability, we need to understand whether the client has any other gains in the year or whether they've got their capital gains tax annual exemptions available to them. Um, in this example, both Mr and Mrs Smith had no other disposal, so we were able to use a capital gains tax exemptions of £24,000 between them to able to reduce the CGT liability. Um, I suppose the other thing to understand is, do is there any other assets um, that would be sort of standing at a loss that we could crystallise to be able to reduce the gain a little bit further? Um, you'll have noticed one of the properties that Mr and Mrs Smith was actually standing at a loss, so that could be used to offset the ones that are, are sitting at a gain. And also whether any of the properties had ever been a main home. <clears throat> so um, obviously the letting relief is gone now, but you would still get main residence relief for the period that you lived in that property plus the last nine months. So that can go a, a good way to reducing the capital gains tax liability. Um, and again, in this case, uh, Mr and Mrs Smith had a property which was fully covered by main residence relief, which meant there was effectively no capital gains tax on that property. Um, the other option that is available is in the right circumstances, you can claim what's called incorporation relief. Um, so it's a relief which effectively allows you to defer the CGT on all the properties which you transfer into, into a company. Um, there are a number of conditions. You used to be able to apply to HMRC for clearance um, to get them to approve whether they thought that that, that, those relief, that relief was available. Um, HMRC have withdrawn that now, so you can no longer um, apply to HMRC for clearance. But there is a number of sort of cases which have gone through the courts in respect to that, which gives a kind of good outline of what would be expected to be able to meet the conditions for incorporation relief. So in the right circumstances, that could be available, but it wasn't available here. Um, moving on to land and buildings transaction tax. This is often the game changer because the tax charge can be quite high. Um, and the residential rates of LBTT is much higher usually than commercial rates when you're transferring commercial properties. Um, and there is also the second home tax charge, ADS, which is 4%. And that also applies on any transfer into a company. However, um, there is relief from the ADS charge where there's six or more properties being acquired in one transaction. So this applied here because we've got six properties. Um, and it allows the ADS to be removed and also for LBTT to be paid at commercial rates rather than residential rates. Um, what I have also seen in the past is where clients perhaps maybe have five properties, so they're one property short to get all this relief. And it's when we've crunched the number, it's almost been worth them buying a, a sixth property to be able to get the relief. Um, and we have done that for some clients in some circumstances um, because the LBTT costs are so high. You also get something called multiple dwellings relief. Um, because when you transfer a number of properties into a limited company, they're treated as linked transactions, which means you can have a higher LBTT charge. Um, however, where everything's made as part of a single transaction, there is the possibility to claim multiple dwellings relief, which basically means that you calculate the LBTT on an average price of each property rather than the total market value. Um, and here we were able to make that multiple dwellings relief um, application and reduce the, the LBTT that was due. Um, there is also another relief where property is held in a partnership between individuals um, and that can actually wipe out the LBTT charge altogether provided that the ownership in the partnership is mirrored in the new company um, and we have used that relief before to um, reduce the LBTT and the ADS charge. So in terms of Mr and Mrs Smith, we kind of calculated that they would have a CGT liability of £7,000 and an LBTT charge of £16,000 after claiming all the relevant reliefs. But what about extraction of the company funds? Because this is often where, um, where it's sort of a deal breaker as well. Do you need the money to, um, to spend and to maintain your lifestyle from the company? Because often the saving that you're getting with the corporation tax um, rate being lower than the personal tax rate is wiped out because you've got personal taxes on whatever you withdraw from the company. Um, but the personal tax impact for Mr and Mrs Smith was minimal because they didn't need the money and they could leave it to roll up in the company. And we could look at different ways of getting the money, some money out of the company for them. So 
Um, they could both use the annual tax-free dividend allowance, which is currently £2,000. Um, they could let the funds accumulate in the company and they could access this at a later date, for instance, on retirement when their other taxable income has decreased. Um, and the funds in the company could also be used to make company pension contributions into their personal pension funds, which is uh, deductible for corporation tax purposes um, and not taxable on Mr and Mrs Smith. Um, and they obviously had their director loan balances, which they could draw down on as they needed to, um, to fund any sort of one-off expenditure that they, that, that they had. So after taking all of this into account, Mr and Mrs Smith decided to go ahead to incorporate the property company. It was right for them because despite the upfront tax costs, there was much larger savings to be had in the longer term. And they didn't have interim ta personal tax costs because they didn't need to withdraw the money from the company. Um, and it definitely worked from there for them, but it doesn't work for everybody. And it is just a case of looking at each person's circumstances um, and working through the numbers. And that's sort of a case study based on somebody that's got an existing property portfolio. A question that I am um, sort of often asked is from people buying their first buy to let property and should they buy that personally or via a company? And again, the answer is it depends, but it often hinges on whether they are willing to take a longer term view and how many properties they intend to buy. For instance, are they intended to buy one or two to supplement their income or do they intend to build out their portfolio such that it is their main source of income in the future? Um, what I tend to find is often at the time of the first property purchase, you're faced with um, an individual who often has reasonably low income. For example, they're just starting out in their career and they've got lower rate income tax bands to utilise. So maybe they'll only pay 21% income tax on their profits. So the tax saving between a company which is paying the corporation tax at 19% and paying 21% income tax is minimal. And obviously you've got additional professional costs when you've got a company because you've got a set of accounts that need to be done and submitted to company's house and you also need a corporation tax return. In that scenario, the finance cost restriction makes minimal difference to their tax liability, so that's not particularly important. Um, and often they need the income from the property to supplement their salary. Um, and if you were to put the property into a company, you would also have personal taxes to withdraw any money out of that company and that sort of mitigates any savings. Um, and the other thing is if they are borrowing, it's often more expensive to lend to a company than it is to borrow individually. So the right thing often at that time is to buy personally. However, you fast forward a number of years and that same person often has much higher income with now no allowances and lower rate bands to utilise and their profits are being taxed at higher income tax rates, around 41% or above. And now the finance restriction is really a problem because they're only getting basic rate tax relief. Um, their portfolio has grown, so they've now got significant LBTT and CGT costs to get the existing portfolio into a company, and that can sometimes be a deal breaker. Um, and clients are considering IHT and succession planning, maybe giving away some properties to children. Again, you've got capital gains tax on any gifts to children, and the CGT costs can be prohibitive. A company is easier to deal with simply because you can give away some shares, but it's more difficult to give away part of a property um, and a company works better on that perspective. So when clients ask, when people ask me that question, I often um, sort of ask, what is your pick, what, what do you intend to do and what's the full picture? Because sometimes it's better to accept some additional taxes in the short term, but overall um, have savings in the longer term. It just depends what it is you want to do and how big a property portfolio you want to build. So moving on, I briefly mentioned um, inheritance tax planning for Mr and Mrs Smith and that they had sort of no idea what, what IHT they would have on their portfolio. Um, just to go back to basics, inheritance tax is a tax charge at 40% and the value of all assets left in a deceased person's estate, which exceed their tax-free allowance after any IHT reliefs. So the main allowance is known as the nil rate band and is currently worth 325000 per person, so 650000 for a married couple. Um, I haven't covered here the main residence nil rate band, but that if you qualify, that can increase the tax free band from um, 650 to a million, provided that the conditions are met. What I find is that people's view on IHT can be very different, ranging from I've paid tax all my life and I'm not paying any more on my death, or some are at the very opposite end of the scale, which is I really don't care about IHT, I'll be dead anyway, 
and it's not for me to deal with. However, the Smiths here did care about the IHT liability um, and they didn't want their children to be left with a large tax burden on their death and was there anything they could do to mitigate that? Um, so focusing on the rental portfolio, we've now got it into a company. Um, sorry, could we go back a slide? Thanks. Um, and while HMRC refer to a property letting business as a, as a business, for IHT purposes, it's deemed to be investment. So there's no reliefs um, available on a property, residential property letting portfolio, which means that even in a company, regardless whether you own it personally or in a company, there's 40% IHT on everything. So that would mean that if something happened to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, they could have a significant IHT liability at the date of their death, assuming that their null rate bans have been used elsewhere. And it's how you're going to fund that liability because um, these are assets and there's, no nece there's not necessarily enough cash to pay that. So do you want to leave the children with a position where they've got to sell properties, potentially incur more tax to pay the IHT? It's not a great position to be in. So what can be done um, Every person's IHT advice will be different based on their personal circumstances, but go in here just to show how a trust can benefit if you start your planning early enough. Um, so we'll move on. We know Mr and Mrs Smith had significant other assets and they did want to pass their property on to their kids over time. Um, so we started to discuss the family trust route. Um, what we suggested was that they establish a discretionary trust. Um, so a wide class of beneficiaries uh, Mr and Mrs Smith could be trustees, so they could still have control over the assets within the trust. Um, and they could start to gift company shares to this trust, which was um, far easier than giving gifts directly to their children. Um, a trust appealed, not only because they still had control, but it also meant that they could protect against um, the children just simply selling off assets um, as they were able to, because they were gifted to them outright. Um, and they also, Mr and Mrs Smith had no idea what would happen with their children in terms of their personal or work life or potential partners or marriage, um, risk of bankruptcy, any of that. Um, and that a discretionary trust protects from that. Um, another key factor was the capital gains tax position. Um, so any gift of shares from Mr and Mrs Smith to their children directly would incur a capital gains tax charge. But when you transfer it into a trust, you can get holdover relief, which means that you defer the gain until the eventual sale of the shares um, by the trustees later down the line. So there's no immediate capital gains tax charge of putting these company shares into trust. Um, so in terms of the value, you do have a restriction there because, as I mentioned before, every UK individual has an IHT tax free allowance, um, and that is the £325,000 each. When you're transferring into a discretionary trust, the maximum you can transfer in in terms of value on a, a company like this is 650,000. Otherwise you incur a lifetime inheritance tax charge at 20%. So um, what we suggested was that this transferred shares worth 650,000 into the trust. Um, provided that they survive seven years, this value is out of their estate altogether. And then their null rate bans renew again, and they can go again and make another transfer into trust. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, if we wind the clock forward, assume that they've lived for seven years, they can transfer further shares into the trust. Um, there are also legal costs and potentially 10 year charges and exit charges in the trust, but these are much less than a 40% IHT charge um, on the whole value of the company. Um, so after 14 years, we've got to the position where we've got the whole value of the company into trust. Potentially there's a 10 year charge there, which is much less than the original 40% IHT charge. Um, and the IHT position is far improved. Um, I do appreciate that not every aspect of this case study will be relevant or appropriate for everyone, but I hope it gives you an idea of the tax pitfalls out there along with the opportunities that are still available when we undertake bespoke and proactive tax planning advice. Um, so finally, I suppose just in terms of one point from today is just to be proactive. Um, some time and effort spent planning now can make a huge difference over time when it comes to property matters.
Um, I hope you found this useful. There's clearly a lot to consider. Um, and apologies if I've ran through some of this too quickly. But um, if you need any further help or you would like to get in touch with a question, please do so. Um, myself or Lynn would be happy to answer any of those. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, uh, Adrian, Jill, and Lynn for your um, thought-provoking presentations there. Um, apologies, first thing to, to notice that we have ran over time, but I thought it was important each of the, the presentations was able to complete. Um, I'm conscious of the fact we have had quite a few questions, both before the event and during the event, so I can give you an assurance that we will follow up on each of these questions um, after the event. Maybe if I take just Quickly, if we could take one of the questions, Adrian, I think this is probably in your direction. Um, just if you've any commentary around about, uh, there's a question come in if, from, a, from an overseas landlord asking about what, what protection is potentially available if our property is empty for a prolonged period due to COVID. I guess that may apply to UK landlords as well, actually. So, yeah, well, we, we, um, it's kind of dictated by insurance companies and, you know, what the provisions of your household insurance is. Some will require you to ensure that you kind of drain down your property if it's going to be empty for a specific period of time. Uh, it also, um, they may say that it requires to be, you know, visited um, or somebody needs to check it, you know, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. And uh, we did introduce a service a couple of years ago, uh, Avoid Property Service, that we do, um, uh, you know, we, we do offer it and we, we, we uh, uh, provide it to uh, quite a lot of our landlords at the moment um, who are have vacant properties for one reason or another. And um, we attend as and when the, the insurance, you know, uh, provisions dictate. So um, that would be one of the, the, the you know, the, the main things I would, you know, recommend, you know, take that void service. Yeah, important to get that one right, I think, yeah. Yes. Okay, as I say, conscious of time. So um, you have my assurance that we will follow up all the other questions uh, post-event. We also intend to email the presentation slides uh, to all of you at some point later today or tomorrow in case there's anything you want to have a read over. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, or indeed feedback for, for any of us, um, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, so thank you very much, all of you, for your time. And uh, goodbye for now.